This is only one of three slides I have, just to keep you occupied. Uh, and so they said, okay, kind of unusual, having a professional talk with no, no PowerPoint presentation. Sure, go ahead, do it. And uh, I, uh, if you're a historian, and you really want to get the dirt, sorry, bad choice, uh, <laughs> on how the Lunar Receiving Lab got to Texas, and at the time, the Manned Spacecraft Center, it was a long and complex political process. Many states wanted the Lunar Receiving Lab, duked it out, and I think uh, LBJ kind of took care of them all. It's, uh, he was pretty good at that. And uh, that was, there was a wonderful history written. NASA really writes great history books. The problem is they all end up as NASA reports and nobody ever sees the damn thing. But uh, there was a, a history, it was called the Lunar Receiving Laboratory Project History, and it has a long NASA number, written by Magnus and Larson. It sounds like some Norwegian thing. Anyhow, uh, the, uh, it really goes through the years from 1964 to 1969 when deciding if they should have a you know, lunar receiving lab. And once they got started, they built this over at the Space Center. Sadly, it is probably going to be torn down shortly. Uh, they have left the building abandoned for some time now, and it's falling apart. Is that correct, Everett? And uh, Judy Alton told me all about it. I uh, to get up to date. I've been here a couple. I was here yesterday. I got a wonderful tour of the uh, sample lab. Where are you? There you are. Yeah. Uh, right. Oh, you can't hear me. Crank this baby up. <laughs> How about that? That better? Okay. I could. Well, where is it? It's right there under my shirt. There we go. Uh, the uh, back in 1969, when we were starting to work in the lunar receiving lab. Uh, are radical, and as uh, earlier, uh, at the time we were protecting the Earth from bugs. And so it was a true quarantine facility, and I'll get into what we had to go through every day to work there. Uh, but it was negative pressure; air came in, went out through. I think it was. Uh, Generated going out, and for you know places to you know exchange rooms where you could bring in equipment, you know close it up, clean it. I think this thing is. Uh, shall I just use this? Okay, all right. Uh, you can kill this one on my lapel. Oh, he can't hear me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, the basics up there, Judy Alton put together in a very nice presentation. Uh, square meters, 24 million, which is pence now. God, you know, you can't, you can't buy a president for that. So uh, the uh, functional areas, you can see there was a crew reception area where after the first Apollo 11, 12, and 14, they were brought back in an Airstream trailer from the aircraft carrier, and they had to spend, I can't remember, it was maybe one or two weeks in there uh, while they tested them to see if they carried anything. And then the samples went into those administration and then the operations areas where the samples were. Uh, the first samples came back, the, the, uh, the rock boxes came back from 
the mission, they went into a big vacuum chamber. They didn't know what was going to happen if they exposed the samples to nitrogen or the atmosphere, something like that. All this crazy stuff about they would explode and things like that. But uh, and because of the incredible uh, equipment that was required to maintain uh, a vacuum in a, about a, oh, two, three meter wide or wide chamber, uh, it was expensive. And the, the director of the LRL at the time was P.R. Bell, who came from Oak Ridge National Lab. And he was very familiar with this, this sort of equipment. And uh, the, he was not that familiar with the business of quarantine. Uh, he was there for, I can't remember how many years. Do you remember, Everett? When did PR retire? I can't remember. Anyhow. Uh, after yeah, after the second mission. The, uh, so it was established, and Apollo 11 was approaching. And, but before that, I, I said I'd, I did make this a personal thing. And how I got there. Uh, straight out of graduate school, I uh, actually was at University of California, Santa Barbara, working with Dick Fisher and Aaron Waters on hydrovolcanism. It's basically when you get volcanoes erupting into shallow water or groundwater, and you get something totally different. Instead of like, instead of like getting a scoria cone, or to most people, it's called a cinder cone. The magma water interaction is really explosive. And you end up, instead of with a cone, you end up with a broad donut-shaped feature called a tough ring. And I was actually doing my dissertation on NASA money for the reason that there were some people who said, well, you know, we've got all these impact craters on the moon, but, you know, tough rings look like impact craters. And if, if, just if, some of those things are tough rings, then we have water below the surface of the moon. And so partly I was hired to worry about that sort of thing. But I came down here when there were basically no jobs in geology. There was nothing in academia. There was nothing in industry and nothing in government. So I gave my talk at the American Geophysical Union meeting in 1968 in San Francisco. And for those of you who know that what AGU right now is about 30,000 people, uh, at that time it was 600. And after I gave my talks, a couple guys walked up, uh, Ted Foss and John Dietrich, and said, how'd you like to give that talk in Houston? I said, sure, why not? And so I came down here kind of nervous and was ready to give this talk about hydrovolcanism. And... Uh, I said, okay, when do I talk? And they said, oh, don't worry about that. Nobody's here. So we have two jobs. One's a postdoc, one's a civil service position. Which one do you want? Civil service, of course, you know, <laughs> no problem. So in the spring of 1969, my wife and I left Santa Barbara and came to Houston, Texas. Got a small apartment in the illustrious town of Webster with its speed traps. And the uh, and immediately went to work. Uh, the working I was going to be part of the the preliminary examination team because of what I knew about volcanic rocks and particularly pyroclastic rocks, which are deposits from explosive eruptions, and. Uh, I also ran what was called the Mineral Separation Laboratory in there, and just outside quarantine in another area. And we had every piece of magnificent equipment you could get in the world to separate minerals. And the logic that NASA had was, well, the principal investigators will want someone to do it for them. Well, here are this beautiful lab. No principal investigator wanted their samples separated. So we will do it ourselves. And so eventually, 
as things moved on, we did use the equipment in other laboratories in studies of the lunar regolith. And uh, so, uh, working conditions. Uh, any of you ever worked in a quarantine facility? No? It's an experience. <laughs> and uh, what you did every day is you went over, the labs were inside in these stainless steel glove boxes where we handled everything. We didn't ever touch the lunar samples. We did it with our hands out like that and down. Um, took off your clothes, took a shower, put on pajamas, uh, things that had been autoclaved and were sterile, and a little cap. Uh, then you went in and you worked in your lab for however long. Uh, sometimes you stayed in there longer than you wanted to because occasionally there would be what's called a spill. Somebody would cut a glove or something like that. And immediately the alarm sounded, all the doors locked, and we were locked in. We couldn't leave until the, the, the spill people, the corn people, had examined the situation. Happens all the time, right? Yeah. Uh, had examined the situation and given an all clear to go out. Now, there were a few stories about some famous scientists who didn't want to get trapped, so they hid. <laughs> And eventually, a couple of them got caught. But if you were exposed, you went into the crew facility with the crew and you spent the rest of your next week in with the crew. Um, and then when you left, you went out, you took off all your stuff, you threw it into a, a box to be steamed, and then you took another soap and, soapy shower and then you walk through an ultraviolet airlock and then you were back out again. So do that, try doing that three or four times a day. You end up with incredibly dry skin. And uh, sometimes you'd forget lunch, but they had a Coke machine outside the door. So I started drinking Coke. That was a mistake. And uh, until I realized how much sugar was in it, and then I stopped because I started gaining weight like crazy. But uh, the, uh, it was uh, interesting, and uh, the equipment, those of us who were doing some of the preliminary examination were working a line, these, one of these lines of, of glove boxes, along with, it went around a corner and to where the, the bio people were doing their prep to expose material to quail and God knows what else. Uh, but we found out, and to get their stuff out, they had to go through our section to the transfer uh, block, or whatever you call it. I'm trying to remember this from 50 years ago, so be, bear with me. <laughs> uh, and boy, were they sloppy. I always thought bio people were tidy and clean, and uh, they weren't. They were pigs. I mean, they were just <laughs> 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 they were really nice people, but. You know, and then finally, you know, in the later missions, they weren't there anymore. So we were able to keep things nice and tidy. Um, the real advantages were we had people working there, internet from all over the world. And you know, here I am, a graduate or just recently graduated person of 27 years old, working side by side with a Nobel. Nobel laureate, you know, that sort of thing. It was just, and we made a lot of good friends of all these people. And, you know, much we've stayed in touch all these years. When I used to go to the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, uh, we'd see quite a few of those people, but I don't go anymore. Don't really have to. Uh, another advantage, any research papers you wrote got published. It had never been done before. And have to, you know, you get it reviewed, but, you know, they say, go, you know, do it. But one of them, the main one, the, the paper that the preliminary examination team had to publish each mission 
for Science Magazine had to be done quickly because the PIs wanted their samples or to be able to work on their samples. Um, the uh, daily meetings after we were through for the day was with the lunar sample analysis and planning team. And uh, the one on Apollo 11 consisted of Wilmot Hess, who was chief scientist at JSC, or MSC, sorry. Uh, Jim Arnold, Jeff Eglinton, Cliff Rondell, Paul Gastet, Gene Shoemaker, Gene Simmons, Bob Walker, G Jerry Wasserberg, and a guy named Zill, who's, I can't remember his first name. But, you know, we we each day we would brief them on what we had seen. I mean, we had analytical equipment in some of the glove boxes, particularly microscopes and things. And one member of the uh, preliminary examination team was a guy named Ray Wilcox, a mineralogist from the Geological Survey, a very precise, quiet man, very quiet. So in one meeting, he was describing a mineral, and he spent 15 minutes describing the mineral. Finally, Hess, who was a very impatient person, exploded and he said, God damn it, if it were on Earth, it would be a plagioclase feldspar. He, he looked at him and he said, it's not from Earth. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after, the, after we got started, uh, we ended up with a, a real, you know, incredible, valuable afterthought that uh, Armstrong had. When they were starting to pack the rock box, uh, he looked at all these beautiful rocks with these pitted surfaces and so on and figured they were pretty delicate. And so he thought about it. He took a shovel and he filled the rock box with soil, with regolith, just filled it. I think it was something like 38 kilograms? Five kilograms, sorry, I'm way off. Okay, 3.8, okay. <laughs> um, and that became lunar sample 10084, which is used for everything that doesn't require a lot of precise, you know, it doesn't have to be from a certain depth or anything like that. If you want to do uh, like density measurements and, you know, the, the uh, soil mechanics team, very good team, did a lot of stuff with it. And, uh, and some of it went to the bio people uh, for feeding to quail and whatnot. And uh, yeah. about that time, we started working on lunar regolith. I did it mostly with David McKay. His wife's here tonight. Uh, others, uh, eventually uh, Bazu from Indiana and, and on. But uh, the, uh, I'm going to put up a, Another. Oop, wrong, too far. Okay. Um, essentially, the Lunar Receiving Lab, there was a lot of input as to what was going on there. Uh, first, the astronauts, then the curatorial staff, and who eventually set up the nu numbering system that's used today, but they didn't do that until about Apollo 12. And the principal investigators who had their input, they were from all over the world. Uh, collaboration with other Mass Spacecraft Center organizations, facilities engineering, they had their work cut out for them with the vacuum chamber and so on. Technical staff, NASA and contractors at the time, it was uh, BRN and Lockheed, yeah, BRN. Like in the mineral separation lab, I had two tremendous technicians who worked for me. And in management, and I talked a little bit about man management and uh, the guy who exploded, wondering why he didn't call it a felspar. But anyhow, uh, water break. The um, question was. As we moved along, particularly, I'll go through all the business with the cores that were taken up. And it was, why study lunar regolith? Well, lunar regolith is essentially provides the insight to the history of the surface of the moon. 
you can collect a nice section of it. Uh, and the exposure, you know, get everything from solar wind implantation to, you know, cosmic radiation to all the, the impacts that keep gardening and turning this over and so on and so forth. Uh, when we first worked there, there were some famous people who were against landing on the moon because they said it was a fairy castle structure, that if they landed on the moon, they would sink into the surface like quicksand. Well, we'd already landed how many surveyors? And they landed just fine, you know, no problem. They'd even done soil mechanics experiments. So it was uh, kind of stupid. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> we landed successfully, or not we, but the crew landed successfully and got out on the surface and wandered around and set up experiments. And, and it all went, all went very well. And it, except for Apollo 13, all the missions went well. But back to the regolith, uh, how do we characterize these things? Uh, we had a lot of grab samples. That, you know, they would go to a, a particular location and scoop up something and put it in a bag, number it, and, uh, and move on. Uh, but starting with Apollo 11, they had these little tubes that were about that long, about that big around. They would pound into the surface to collect a... a you know, a section, essentially. Well, it didn't work on Apollo 11 very well because the bit on the end was wrongly designed. Instead of allowing the, the regulus to flow into the tube, it forced it out. And the, des the bit design was by a famous geologist. I won't mention. But uh, <laughs> actually, it turned out pretty well because a little bit of stuff got in there. It was really jumbled. It was a mess. And so actually, a, how many grams, 700 grams from that core went to bio so they could do with it as they, as they wished. So that wasn't a great loss. And uh, the, uh, yeah, the protocol at the time called for 700 grams of quote unquote fines for the people to work with. I'm going to take a little diversion here, and okay, we're talking about the lunar regolith, the lunar soil, as it were. And what is it made up of? It's made up of the rocks and minerals of all the, you know, from all the impact craters. But the major component is something that comes from this constant gardening of the lunar surface. And because there's very high flux, particularly of mi micrometeorites coming in and hitting the surface, and melting whatever it hits. And you end up with this melt, some of the minerals, some of the rocks, and you get this little ugly thing, ugly kind of cauliflower shaped particle, which may range from one micrometer up to, you know, half a, half a centimeter in some cases. And we call them agglutinates. And they're bonded by glass. It's really dirty glass. It's, it's just really filthy. But it's, uh, it's unique and if you look at it closely, within this glass are beautiful little droplets of pure iron, Fe naught. And that comes from, you've got the solar wind coming in, implanting particles there. You've got the micrometeorite coming in and when it hits, there's, there's a, all the iron minerals, there's a reduction process and you end up with scattered little things of Fe naught. If you look at a polished thin section of it, it looks like a little galaxy or something like that. Very, very beautiful stuff. But it, it makes up most everything that we know of so far. We haven't been to whole moon yet. David's going to do that. But uh, uh, it makes it the major component. And eventually, we had a better core design on Apollo 12. Still the skinny little core like that. And we ended up with... Uh, a very successful 40 centimeter double core. And uh, I'll even give, this, give you the score of the game. No, okay. But uh, because they had redesigned the bit and the regolith flowed in as it should have. And uh, that one turned out to be a beautiful core. And I'll talk a little bit about how we handled it. 
Uh, but in, I was talking about agglutinates, and uh, Dave McKay and I and Dick Morris uh, and others uh, essentially started developing a concept of soil maturity. Basically, how long has it been at the surface and reworked before it's buried by you know, another impact from somewhere else? And that worked out pretty well. So you could, you could see you know, these agglutinates, you'd start out with really sort of fresh material that hadn't been exposed for very long, just bits of rock and mineral. And then with this exposure over tens of millions of years, uh, you get these things building up until they're like 70, 80 percent of the sample. Also, the uh, Dick Morris did the ferromagnetic resonance, and that would change with going on. Um, but at that time, in the Lunar Receiving Lab, we were running out of steam. The missions were so damn close together that we couldn't finish one before the next one started. And uh, we had Apollo 13, which was a crisis, which thankfully was resolved. And then with the follow-up uh, studies of what happened on Apollo 13, it gave us the time to catch up in the Lunar Receiving Lab and get more equipment and actually build some new uh, glove boxes, big stainless steel glove boxes. And I got, I can't, Fred's not here, but Fred's about, Fred Hertz is about that tall. And I was the scientist in charge of helping design this glove box. Pretty big one. I can't remember what the, NASA loves the acronyms, and I don't remember what they called it. But uh, so they said, how high do you want the gloves? And I said, about like that. They, they built it. And Fred Hertz comes in and says, uh, <laughs> so he got him a stool. <laughs> but, you know, going back into NASA and its acronyms, uh, we had a, the management of the LRL had a contest to see what to name this, you know, what acronym were we going to use for this facility. I suggested Lunar Sample Containerization Receiving and Packaging. Less crap. <laughs> <laughs> It, uh, it didn't fly. <laughs> River, what did, what did they end up calling it? Was that the snap line? Snap. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. There you go. Uh, we went into the J missions, and things really changed. We ended up with, how are we doing? We're doing fine. Okay. You're going to get your food in a little bit. So <laughs> uh, the new cores... Okay, the earlier cores were basically had liners in them that were held together with, I think, Teflon or something. And so to dissect the core, you had to slide it out, cut the liner, move the top off, and then start describing, dissecting, and so on. And dissecting a section took about two months. We take it apart grain by grain and put it in sample containers after all the descriptions. And uh, yeah. new cores were about that much in diameter. And you could put two sections together so you could get you know, a total core about like that. And they were just beautiful. They just went right in and collected beautiful, beautiful samples of sections. I mean, undisturbed sections, essentially, because it was thicker, so you didn't have the effect of the walls, you know, dragging things along. Uh, yeah. Okay, how did we examine these babies? Uh, without the liner, how are you going to get the core out? So in one of the glove boxes, they had a milling machine. And so you clamp the... This happened, for, this was for both the bigger ones and the drill, and the drill cores, which were much narrower but went much deeper. Uh, they would mill the sides, they would clamp it in, mill the sides of the core on both sides to down to about maybe a millimeter or so, very thin. And then you would put it, take it to where you were going to work on it, and then take a scalpel and cut through that last little bit of aluminum, and then take the top off and get started. But we, we instituted something, I'm, I'm moving around here, 
change. We instituted something before we we started doing this because we had a lot of questions about, okay, the core comes back. How do we know what's in it? Is it disturbed? Is it intact? So we suggested that uh, we x-ray them. And uh, what we would do was bring the core sections in to the lab, put them like triply bagged Teflon bags, and then we would take them out and walk across the campus, carrying these cores to the medical facility. They would take beautiful x-rays, and we had, you know, we could see what was there and how we, you know, give us some idea of how to proceed. And then we go through the dissection process. Uh, yeah, my favorite story is with the deep drill core in Apollo 15, which was very controversial because one of the designers had, they were supposed to drill down with the electric drill and then jack it out. Well, the jack was designed backwards, so they had a hell of a time. And Dave Scott was trying to pull it out, just pull it out. And he couldn't do it, so they went in. And the last EVA, they had been scheduled to go to another crater complex north of the landing site. We fought out, fought it out with some people about that. We said, do we go to the landing, to the craters, or do we pull out the, the core? And the majority said, pull out the core. So we did. And uh, he got it out. He injured his shoulder and his hand doing it, but he got it out. Tough guy. And so we got him, got him back to Earth, and then we, we quickly took them over in their bags to the clinic <laughs> and had them x-rayed. And they were beautiful. They were, they were, they were intact. They were full. Uh, there was nice layering in them. So we took the x-rays and made a, a large ink drawing, you know, of all of them together. And uh, took the big board that we had them on and raced it over to the auditorium at the at Johnson uh, Man Spacecraft Center, where they're holding the Apollo 15 press conference. And reporters said, "Well, Dave, was it worth it saving the damn core?" And we raced in with this thing, gave it to Dave, and he looked at it and he said, "Yes, it was. It was fine." <laughs> And so the x-ray saved us that time. Before we did that, we went through with a lot of the uh, people on the advisory panel about would x-radiation affect any of the samples. And after a lot of testing, the answer was no. So just go ahead, do it. And uh, But uh, these uh, dissection huh, took us a long time, particularly on the big ones. Uh, I had a lot of help. I had uh, Rolf Rixell, a good friend from Washington State University, who was familiar with doing this with his work with archaeologists, believe it or not. And uh, George Sellers, Mike Duke, and eventually Stu Nagel. Does anybody know where Stu is? Okay. Uh, we would eventually get through the dissection of the top half, you know, flat along the core. And then we, we created a peel. I don't know if you know what a peel is. A lot in archaeology, you basically lay some fabric on the surface and you put on like epoxy and let it soak in. Peel it back, you get about two grains thick layer of the whole thing, including the stratigraphy. And the main reason for that was just to preserve the record. I don't know where they're kept anymore. Special cabinet, Special cabinet. okay. And uh, they're very appealing, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, the, uh, the, we continue this on and through the different missions and particularly Apollo 17, very successful drill cores very successful push cores, and particularly, I don't know if you remember the Shorty Crater orange soil. Uh, got Jack very excited because on Earth, that orange would indicate hydrothermal alteration. 
in a, in a round of all three. Well, uh, it wasn't, <laughs> but it was really interesting. And uh, what it was were uh, were pyroclastic deposits from uh, eruptions of a very low viscosity magma, forming what was called the the uh, dark. Um, Anyhow, around the, the maria, there's quite often broad areas of very dark uh, material, and they come from a point and turn out to be from these eruptions. And how they get that far was something figured out a long time ago by one of the directors of the Lunar Science Institute, Tom McGetchen. He and his team at MIT, they were going out to places like Northeast Crater in, uh, on Etna and Stromboli with high-speed cameras and acoustic material. And they were looking at essentially determining trajectories and arcs and velocities and things like where things would go. And they did that, and you basically came up with a great story of how a scoria cone, a cinder cone, forms. And, but with the, uh, the dark mantle terrain was what I'm thinking about. They were starting to think about, okay, they took the information, the data from these velocities and so on, put them into models for one-sixth gravity in a vacuum to see what you would get. And you would get these broad, uh, dark mantle areas, which worked out beautifully. But uh, Dave and I and David Vanneman, we worked on the orange, well, the orange soil, as it were, Turned out they were volcanic deposits and a very unique little beautiful orange glass spheres, tiny, perfect, clear as a bell. And uh, that formed the quote unquote orange soil. It wasn't a orange soil, it was actually a volcanic ash deposit. And then on top of that, on top of that, anyhow, uh, what they called the black glass. Well, it wasn't black glass. It was the same stuff, only it came out differently. And if you've got a, a lava fountain going like this and it's going out and being thrown clear in, in the uh, vacuum, uh, the radiation, it very quickly cools and you get glass. If it's right below the center, the material is going up and then coming back down again, hitting the other droplets and sticking together, so you end up with composites, and it changes the thermal history. So instead of just pure glass, you get glass with what's called quench crystallization, beautiful little crystals going across. And if you look at these things very closely, you see that there are these crystals and the orange glass is in between them. So, But it turned out that the section that Jack sampled on Shorty Crater was upside down, and it was intact, but it was probably a flap from the formation of Shorty Crater, like that. So after being hired by NASA to work on volcanic ash, by God, we finally found it. And then going backwards, there are a lot similar situations at Apollo 15 with the green glass. And then going back to some other missions, you see little bits and pieces of these beautiful glassy spheres uh, scattered throughout the soil. Uh, so that was the rationale for my being there. How are we doing? We're doing just, we're on time. Uh, but I thought I'd use this to talk about some unanswered regolith questions, something that's been driving me nuts for 50 years. Uh, something called the what I call the lunar dura crust. Look at that famous boot print, boot print picture. You see along the edges little sheets that have been essentially this surface here is bonded by something we don't know what. It's probably a millimeter thick, maybe two millimeters thick. And also, we had there. There was an instrument 
first three missions called the Apollo Lunar Surface Close-Up Camera. It, went, went, it plunked it down on the ground and it had a uh, flash in it and it took stereo pictures of, a, of an area about like that. And if you look at some of those from along the edges of the boots, you see these beautiful little sheets that are there. We don't know what's holding them together. And it certainly kills some of the ideas of dust rising from the surface because those things, you've probably seen this on, on lakes that have just dried up. You see a little dewar crust on top, that sort of thing. Uh, the, uh, the albedo changes also. And if you look, like say for example, on the J missions, they had wonderful high resolution panoramic cameras on those on the command modules. And they took incredible photographs of the lunar surface. And so people were duking out on 15 as to where in the world they had traveled you know, using surface descriptions. And so I, NASA at that time had a mapping group. I don't know if they still do. So they were handling the, the negatives from these, these cameras. So I went over and said, I want you to blow that of the, of the 15 site. I want you to blow that up as much as you can. I ended it up with a print about like that by about six feet. And look carefully. There is the limb. There's the lunar rover. And there's all the tracks from the lunar rover, the albedo, because of this sort of phenomenon. And uh, going back to the moon, uh, yeah, once you disturb it, it's there. Oh, also, in one of the larger cores we were dissecting, uh, going through the section of the core, there were little slightly darker sheets of material. I call them clods. Uh, scattered throughout the regolith, and it's, it's this stuff that's broken up and worked into the regolith itself. We tried for years to get funding to study this, like what is bonding this stuff together? And Dave McKay suggested it was vapor from, you know, some all these impacts that were going on, but we don't know. And uh, so it's it's a mystery for the next group. Are you here young enough to be the next group? Uh, the, uh, okay, there you go. Uh, and that's pretty much it. You know, I'll leave you with uh, Dura Crust. And, uh, but three people asleep, so it's not too bad. So, <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm five minutes over. Sorry about that. Five minutes will take off your per diem. <laughs> oh, I, I get per diem? Oh. <laughs> All right. So we'll take uh, take some questions we'll, right here. Uh, two questions, if you don't mind. Uh, what's a J mission? And, uh, okay, J mission is when they have the rovers. Oh, Roger. Okay, and uh, fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen. Got it. And as as a worker there in that facility, along with the rest of the workers, uh, typically you guys, how much lunar material have you got at home? None. <laughs> Absolutely none. Pardon me. None. Really? Well, Jesus, you know, we'd be in jail. <laughs> and I know you two from Freeland, right? St. Augustine's. Yeah. Over there. Hi. Um, with everything that we've learned about lunar regolith in the last 10 years or so, um, and the, all the renewed interest, is there, do you know if there's any plan for a second edition of the Lunar Source book? There is no. It took uh, three editors, well, four, counting Madam, great editor here. Uh, and how many people in L L LSI? Probably a total. 
illustrators and photographers and so on. It took us, and we had 20 people who knew where the bodies were that we pulled in to work on it. And they worked on their sections and took, what, how long? Six years? Six years. And then when we finished, Dave McKay and I, and then we added Bevan French to the, the crew, said it reads like it's written by a bunch of committees. So we took another year and rewrote it, the whole thing, all 726 pages. Uh, the, the, I tried to get some people to carry on another Lunar Source book, but that person sadly is no longer with us. So, I assume there are some lunar samples left. Uh, where are they uh, being kept? Or where the will they be? Lunar sample kept? facility, lots of them. Ryan, you want to answer that? I have a question. Um, no, you have to answer him. Oh, I'm sorry. Nobody can hear you. There's about 85% of the original 842 pounds that were collected still exist in our labs that hasn't been handed out yet. So this Duracross sounds really interesting. How do I recognize it so that I can suggest to people that they study it? Where am I going to find it? Like, you know, most of the soils were scoop samples. And so in the cores, when we were dissecting those cores, we thought we thought, you know, there's, there's a little dark, slightly darker, slightly finer green sheets scattered throughout. We sampled those very carefully. So they are separated from the rest of the, the soil that was around it in. I don't remember which core it was, but uh, one of them. And so they're there, ready for your analysis. You think that um, if we go back to the South Pole instead of the equator like Apollo, will the soil be different or about the same? This man will answer your question. Uh, it'll be the same and different. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, it's a highland province, and so mineralogically, uh, it's very similar to the Apollo 16 soils, um, but also in the polar region are uh, areas that never see the sun and they get very cold. Um, and one of the reasons we're going to the South Pole is there may be volatiles entrained in the regolith, and, and that has the potential of changing the properties of the regolith. Uh, and I could stand up here and speculate on how it might be different, but the best way to answer that question is to land in 2024 and actually measure how it's different. I, I wondered uh, if there's any big difference in the soil between the, the lighted side of the, the moon and the dark side. Structurally. Oh, it shouldn't be because the sun gets over there eventually. Depends on what day of the week. <laughs> no, it should be the same or similar. I mean, the, the, what you're working with, you know, the, the 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 basement varies. You know, like if you're in the highlands, it's going to be one type. If you're on the maria, all the lava flows, it's going to be another, and so on. And, you know, the exception was uh, at Shorty Crater, Apollo 17, which was totally unique and really was fresh enough that it hadn't been worked over and matured. It was just pure volcanic ash. Do you have a sense of how much of the uh, surface of the moon is the impactors versus the original mass of the moon? What came in from outside versus what was there when it accreted or spawned off of Earth? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Ryan? <laughs> talking about the impact that formed the moon, or are you talking about the impact? 
So when you look at the bulk composition of the regolith, you need about one or two percent of meteoritic material to make the composition match. Whether that's capturing it all or not, not sure, but so a few percent is probably a good answer. Mm -hmm. 